Hi, I'm Matt. Welcome to this video on Hubble and the expansion of the universe. Um, I really like this quote by Edwin Hubble. Equipped with his five senses, man explores the universe around him and calls the adventure science. So I like to think of it and the fact that, you know, we live on this planet that orbits this star. And from our little place on this planet in the universe, we can sort of gaze out and examine the universe and try and work out things about it and how it behaves. So the first thing I want to talk about is, you know, star spectra. And so we have, to have this sort of idea from spectra that we'd get these beautiful black body radiation curves for star spectra. Um, but star spectra, as it says there, is not so perfect. We get these spectral plots that look a bit more like this. So this spectrograph, you've got lots of different absorption lines, and those absorption lines relate to the chemical elements that are present in that star. So this relates to a few different places in the syllabus. Both in Module 7, The Nature of Light, we're looking at, you know, investigate how spectra of stars can provide information on mainly rotational and translational velocity and chemical composition. The other part of the syllabus that this relates to is from Module 8, which is from the Universe to the Atom, looking at investigate the evidence that led to the discovery of the expansion of the universe by Hubble. So Hubble actually detected the expansion of the universe. And so he looked at a variety of different clusters in galaxies. So one of the first things he looked at, you know, was this cluster in Virgo. Um, and so in this galaxy, it was a distance to this galaxy of 78 million light years. So that's quite a distance. And he observed the hydrogen and potassium lines and measured their redshifts. Now, looking at their redshifts, seeing where they are, these spectral lines to where they should be, you can actually work out the recessional velocity. So he worked out that for this galaxy in the Virgo cluster, the Virgo constellation, it was receding at 1,200 kilometers per second. Um, just to contrast that with this object in Hydra, it's nearly receding at, sorry, its distance to it is about 4 billion light years, and its recessional velocity was 61,000 kilometers per second. So you can see already there's a relationship between the distance, so how far something is away from us, and its recessional velocity that we determine by the redshifts of its spectral lines. So we can actually plot this sort of information on a graph, and that's the goal of the activity today. Um, and so on the y-axis here, we have recessional velocity in kilometers per second. And on the x-axis here, we have distance to the galaxy in megaparsecs. So that's a different unit to light years that we looked at here over the left. But one megaparsec is basically a lot bigger. It is um, 3.26 million light years. So you can see that with all these data points on this graph, we can plot a line of best fit, which goes through the origin, zero, zero. Um, this graph isn't perfect. You can see there's a lot of data points above and below the line. But from this line of best fit, we can actually work out Hubble's constant. And I'll go through that a little bit later on. Um, it's interesting to note that with recessional velocity, we have a few objects below zero on this graph uh, with negative recessional velocity, which actually means that these objects are moving towards us. Um, so an example of that is the Andromeda galaxy, our neighboring galaxy in the night sky. So we're, we're in the Milky Way galaxy. There's Andromeda, and it's, it's actually moving towards us. So it's got, um, instead of recessional velocity, it's actually coming towards us. So just looking at Hubble's law over here, we have recessional velocity represented by the V there, is measured in kilometers per second, is equal to the distance the object is away, which is measured in megaparsecs, multiplied by this H naught. So this constant H naught is Hubble's constant, which is measured in kilometers per second per megaparsec. So once again, the object of our activity today is to actually find Hubble's constant. So to do that, we can divide this side by D, and it'll appear on this side of the equation. So if we go recessional velocity, so V divided by D, distance, will actually give us the recessional velocity of an object. If we do this for lots of objects and plot the line of best fit on the graph, hopefully our recessional velocity is a little bit closer to the truer value. So to do this, we first need to continue, uh, consider stellar evolution, how stars evolve and how they're formed. So initially, stars are made in molecular clouds in big nebulae. 
and these clouds condense underneath the force of gravity. So eventually you're going to have something form called a protostar, which is before thermonuclear fusion has actually started. And once thermonuclear fusion starts, the star then becomes a main sequence star, fusing hydrogen into helium. Now at the end of the star's main sequence life, it'll then potentially become, so it'll then become a red giant, burning lots of different elements, fusing lots of different elements in different shells. Now we're going to mainly focus on the left-hand side of this diagram here. So if the star has less than or equal to five solar masses, so five times the mass of our sun, it'll explode in what's called a planetary nebula. And this has like a bit of a gas cloud. And inside that nebula, it'll leave behind a little white dwarf, a little core of a star uh, that has no more thermonuclear fusion happening. And that core of the star, very importantly, is going to be less than 1.4 solar masses. If it's any bigger than 1.4 solar masses, it'll actually explode. Um, so I said we have a planetary nebula. If we had more than five solar masses worth of material in the star to begin with, it'll then explode not in a planetary nebula, but in a supernova. So how do we use these events to calculate the age of the universe or even the recessional velocity of things? Well, these events actually help us calculate distance. So most of the stars in the universe actually exist as binary star systems. So these are two stars that are gravitationally bound to each other. An example of this in the night sky is Sirius A and Sirius B. So Sirius A is a big main sequence star, so fusing hydrogen into helium, and Sirius B is a white dwarf. But in this image, it is no longer a main sequence star, it's actually expanded to become a red giant. So when Sirius A finishes its main sequence life and becomes a red giant, it'll actually have a larger diameter and weaker surface gravity. And because of that weaker surface gravity, this white dwarf can start siphoning off material, siphoning off matter, and increasing in mass. So remember I said earlier that the mass limit for a white dwarf is 1.4 solar masses. So once it passes this mass limit, which is actually 1.44 solar masses, it will explode. And it's a very special type of supernova called a type 1A supernova. The reason why it's special is it always explodes with the same brightness. So that brightness is its absolute magnitude, of negative 19.6. So the absolute magnitude is um, how bright the object would be as measured from 10 parsecs. Um, but with regards to the magnitude scale, negative 19.6, um, the more negative the number, the brighter the explosion or the brighter the object. So we won't actually measure supernovae events at negative 19.6, they'll be a bit dimmer than that. That might be negative 15, might be negative 10. And so we can use the difference between how bright it is compared to how bright it should be to work out the distance. Um, a simple analogy to sort of understand this is if someone shined a torch at you um, at night time and then you close your eyes and they disappeared into the distance some, some way, and then you open your eyes and they shine the torch at you again, you'd sort of be able to estimate the distance to them based on the intensity of the light of the torch. So as I said earlier, we can use the difference between its uh, absolute magnitude, so how bright it should be compared to how bright we view it from Earth, which is called its apparent magnitude, to work out the distance to it. So the equation we use to do this is called the distance modulus, or what we're going to do today is use an online calculator to do this for us. So once we know the distance to the star, we can examine the spectral lines to find the redshift of the spectral lines, and using that redshift, find the recessional velocity. So now what we've found is not just the distance to the star, but its recessional velocity. And now we, if we plot these on the graphs, we can work out the recessional velocity of an object versus distance to find Hubble's constant. And once we find Hubble's constant, we can also use that to find the age of the universe, which is pretty cool. So what we're gonna do now is actually go to this website and collect some data on supernova events. These supernova events were captured by a telescope at Siding Spring Observatory. Um, and so we're gonna use the data on those supernova events, those type 1A events, to work out the expansion of the universe and create our own Hubble diagram.